My name is Rebecca Friedman, and I'm the co-director of the Miami, Florida European Union Center of Excellence here at FIU, and we are a consortium with the University of Miami. I want to give a very warm welcome today to everybody who is here. Thank you for coming, even when the university is closed, um, and thank you for being here with us today. I want to give a, a number of special thank yous to the many partners who have made this possible today, including first of all, the Italian General Consul here in Miami, the Honorable Adolfo Barattolo. Also a big thank you to Luis Sanchez back there. Luis Sanchez, thank you. The Director of the English Language Institute at FIU. Also to Carol Damien, the Director of the Frost Art Museum. To Silvia Barisioni of the Wolfsonian and also Peter has come as well, and so on and so on today. I welcome you all um, on behalf of the University at FIU and also on behalf of Dr. John Stack, the uh, Director of the School of International Public Affairs, who could not be here today. And finally, of course, as always, a huge thank you to Christine Kelly, who is probably already so over there. Today. <laughs>
first one is a strong support for the process of European integration. So everything which has to do with Europe. The second uh, basic pillar is the strong transatlantic link, a strong link between Italy and the United States, of course our strongest and most important ally. And the third element of the Italian foreign policy is our focus on some regions that for obvious region reasons are very important for us. I'm talking about the Mediterranean and the Middle East, I'm talking about the Balkans, relations with China. So these are fundamentally the three uh, main pillars of Italian foreign policy, foreign policy which once again have not truly changed in spite of changing governments rather frequently since the end of the war. We now do have a, a new government which is uh, uh, in place uh, formed after the elections. It's a government led by a young and dynamic uh, 46 years old uh, man uh, Enrico Letta, and, and we are sure that he's going to continue along the lines that I just described uh, uh, to you. So I will, I will elaborate very briefly on the three elements I've mentioned to you and then I'm ready to take any questions on what I've said or on any other issues ranging from the UN uh, to uh, NATO to any other issue. The first was, as I mentioned to you, the process of European integration. Italy is a founding member of the European Union, as you know, the Treaty of Rome, which established the uh, fundamental block of what is today the European Union. Um, founding member, but also I would say the general population in principle has always been a staunch supporter of this process of European uh, integration. Of course, today, as we read the newspapers, which we all do, I hope, um, we tend to identify Europe with what we see in terms of the Euro crisis, the financial crisis, a crisis, by the way, which was not born in Europe, which was originated elsewhere, you think about the Lima brothers and so on. Um, so, um, uh, people tend to identify Europe today with this kind of crisis. But frankly, the notion of Europe, the idea of Europe, goes well beyond the economic and financial element. It goes well beyond the single market, which we have. It goes well beyond the single currency that many countries in Europe now have, once again, the euro. The process of European integration is a political process, is truly a cultural process, and frankly, if this crisis, if this financial crisis has taught us anything at all, it has taught us that we need more Europe, we don't need less Europe. So, the crisis has actually accelerated uh, the process of European integration. There are things that were being discussed at length in these endless meetings, you know, to, to have 27 countries agree on an issue, it's not an easy task. And some of these things were discussed at length in long meetings, after meetings, it's only normal, that's, that's the way multilateral diplomacy actually works. And at the end of the day, you have a product which is the result of this discussion, which is the, co the collective will of those countries engaged. Well, this crisis, once again, has accelerated that process, has led the nations to overcome some petty interests and to take some very important decisions. So, for instance, just to give you a few hints, today, uh, Europe has a central bank in Frankfurt, which is much stronger than it used to be six or 12 months ago. It has many more powers than it used to have um, six or 12 months ago. We are now working very actively towards a true banking union. Uh, before, there were banking regulations and oversight mechanisms in all the different countries. Today, we are about to have in place a very strong centralized oversight mechanism by which we will avoid banks getting into trouble, something no one wants, of course. And, and so, as you can see, and these are just a couple of examples, if anything, the crisis has accelerated the process of European integration. And this confirms, I think, what I was saying a moment ago, that even in this time of crisis, we need more Europe, we don't need less Europe. And frankly, when I say more Europe, I also think about the process of political integration of Europe. Unfortunately, we are not at that point yet 
where uh, Europe speaks with a single voice in foreign policy. I would argue that uh, in foreign policy, uh, let me get this right, uh, um, Europe punches below its weight. Europe is a major economic and financial global power. It's a major, it's the most important global trade entity. But in terms of speaking with a single voice in foreign policy, we're not there. So I would argue that uh, the uh, weight of Europe in international politics should be more than what it is today. So we do hope that we're getting to the day when true political integration will be, will be uh, achieved. The same also applies, I would argue, to the whole domain of security and defense. I don't believe that we are there yet in terms of achieving a true uh, uh, capability of Europe to assure a role in defense, uh, military role of Europe, for instance, in international peacekeeping operations. Individual nations do, obviously, but not Europe as such. So these are some targets for the future. Which, on which I think we should work very, very actively. Before I leave this first issue, this first pillar of Italian foreign policy, which is once again European Union, European integration, let me mention for you one aspect which is truly very important also from an American perspective. You may have heard or read that Europe and the European Union and uh, the United States have decided to launch some very important trade negotiations aimed at achieving what is called a TTIP, a Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, short, uh, a free trade area, covering the two sides of the Atlantic. This is going to be a great initiative. Uh, it will remove, hopefully, all the existing barriers, the tariff barriers and the non tariff barriers, regulations, certifications and so on, uh, allowing for a free trade area encompassing 800 million people, I would argue even 800 million affluent people. So there are studies that show that this is going to lead to a dramatic increase in trade between the two sides of the Atlantic. This is going to lead to an increase of the GDP of the individual nations, including the US, by probably 1% per year. Uh, this is going to lead to an increase of the American exports to Europe by about 30%, meaning $200 billion of additional exports from the US towards Europe. So you can see the benefit that this will bring to the American manufacturers, to the American exporters, and at the end of the day to the American economy, jobs, and so on and so forth. So the negotiations will begin for the TTIP, for this free trade area, uh, in the month of July. And there is hope to be able to conclude them within, let's say, a couple of years. And if we, if we manage to do this, and I'm sure we will be able to do this, this is going to be a great achievement for all of us on the two sides of the Atlantic. The second pillar of the Italian foreign policy is a rock solid relationship between Italy and the United States. This dates since the time of the war. Italy and the US are truly side by side on all the most important uh, policy issues. Um, we are together, of course, in NATO. And I would also say that Italian soldiers are operating side by side with the American military in many important theaters around the world, ranging from Afghanistan to Kosovo, uh, from counter piracy uh, to initiatives we have in Lebanon, and so on and so forth. We also did the Libya operation together, by the way. Let me elaborate on this just for a few seconds uh, in a very shorthand style, then I can take any questions you may, you may have. Afghanistan remains the most complicated uh, uh, security operation in which we are all involved. By the way, you do know that we are there under a mandate emanating from the United Nations. Italy is the uh, fourth largest contributor to Afghanistan. We have more than 4,000 troops there. And I would like to say very clearly, we are not rushing for the exit like some other European partners have, uh, have done. We are there. It will be a drawdown from today until the end of 2014, together with the American troops, together with the NATO troops, we're going to slow, slow down our presence and reduce it. And then after 2014, we will remain, we will not abandon 
Afghanistan, no one can risk, no one can run the risk that Afghanistan falls back into a failed state, becoming the hub for international terrorism once again, as we have seen it happen uh, in many, many cases. Unfortunately, 9-11 is the most striking case of that trend. So, Italy will remain with other countries beyond 2014, after the end of the current operation, with a completely different role. We will remain in a training role, and we will also be providing some important financing uh, to the Afghan security forces, to the Afghan army at the end of the day, uh, $150 million per year between 2015 and 2017. We are also present in Kosovo, where the situation is nearly solved, but not completely solved as we speak. So we are also there together with American, German and other troops. We are leading the uh, UN mission in Lebanon. We have more than 1,000 troops in Lebanon. And the mission, which is called the UNIFIL, is led by an Italian general. We are very active in the counter piracy operations in the uh, Indian Ocean and other parts of the world. So as you can see, this shows that Italy is an active provider of security. We are among the countries of the world who are most active in providing for peacekeeping operations. As, as a matter of fact, at the United Nations, Italy is the Western largest supplier of peacekeepers. I think this is a very indicative, uh, indicative um, figure. Secretary of State John Kerry was in Rome yesterday. He has some very important meetings with the Italian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. They discussed specifically uh, uh, the cooperation on Syria and in other areas of the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And this leads me to my third and final point. And my third and final point has to do with those areas that uh, for obvious ge geographical regions are very close to our priorities of foreign policy. Um, one of them is the Mediterranean, and when you think about the Mediterranean, I'm sure you're thinking about the um, Arab awakening. Um, it was called Arab Spring, uh, but now the correct way to define it uh, has become the Arab awakening. I'm sure that in all of those countries, from Egypt to Tunisia, from Algeria uh, to, to Jordan and others, and some countries of the Gulf, um, we are not where we had expected to be uh, after the Arab Spring, after the Arab Awakening. We had sort of imagined, maybe dreamed, that uh, those uh, revolts, those elections, would lead immediately, within the brief span of six months, to a sophisticated, uh, sort of Scandinavian-looking kind of democracy. Well, of course, Egypt is not Finland, uh, Algeria is not uh, Sweden or Switzerland, so it takes time. It takes time and it will take time. So I think our task is to support, to continue to support these countries, to progressively evolve towards true representative democracies, and at the same time to avoid the dramatic risk that they fall under the control of fundamentalism which is obviously a risk in those areas. So we remain engaged in all of these countries uh, trying to support the evolution towards democracy. Syria is an area of dramatic concern. Uh, as you know, the regime of uh, Assad must have killed by now 70,000 or 80,000 group of his own citizens. It is something that is completely unacceptable. But of course, it's very difficult for the international community to understand how to intervene in a situation like, uh, like Syria. And of course, all of this is enhanced by the risk that uh, Assad makes use of the chemical weapons that he has uh, largely. There are now some indications he may have, but exactly what kind of use of the chemical weapons is not entirely clear. So right now, the Western community is discussing possible ways to strengthen our action to support the opposition in Syria and to make sure that a transition occurs that leads to a true democratic nation. Obviously, this is an extremely complex process which will require a lot of time. Uh, finally, a word on Russia. Uh, Italy has traditionally been very uh, close to uh, Russia for a variety of reasons. Um, 
of course, are falling on the one hand with concern some trends in Russia that are not very encouraging in terms of the democratic trends within the country, the way in which elections are run, the way in which uh, opposition is, is treated, uh, the way in which NGOs are treated. But at the same time, from a geostrategic point of view, uh, we believe that uh, uh, Russia is a partner, is an important partner for the stability and security in the Euro-Atlantic uh, region. So we do hope that it will be possible for the Putin regime uh, to grasp some extraordinary opportunities that are out there and join the West into a process to uh, ensure stability and security. I'm thinking here of two things. Number one, uh, pertaining to Syria, as I just mentioned, uh, Russia has not been very forthcoming in, 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 in helping finding solutions, in particular at the United Nations. They seem to be uh, still in a position of supporting the regime uh, of uh, Mr. Assad. Uh, so we do hope that uh, Russia will be able to evolve in its position. And frankly, the visit that Mr. Kerry paid to, Vos to Moscow just two or three days ago seems to show some opening for the first time on the Russian side. And the second uh, opportunity that the Russians, I think, should seek is the one pertaining to missile defense. NATO, the West, the United States have made, made many, many offers to Russia to be part of the missile defense protecting the whole of Europe, uh, protecting Europe against Iranian missiles, against North Korean missiles. Uh, so far, they have not responded positively. I do hope that Russia will respond in a positive way to this opportunity, which would allow also Russia to spend less money on another arms race, which Russia in any case cannot afford, uh, and focus on the resources that Russia has available on the domestic infrastructure, the energy consumption, and things like that that are truly a priority. So I will stop right here because I think um, I just wanted to provide you a sketch of, um, of what the Italian foreign policy is. As, as I mentioned to you, those three pillars, once again, support for the European integration, the strong relations with the United States, and finally, focus on some regions that are very close to our priority interests have been pillars of Italian foreign policy for the last 60 years and will remain the fundamental pillars of Italian foreign policy for many, many years uh, to come. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I am ready to take any question on any of the issues I discussed, but also ones I have not addressed, once again, like the United Nations or UN reform or NATO or what Italy has done uh, to tackle the dramatic uh, Euro crisis of the 12, of the last 12 months. And I would argue we have taken some very strong measures, some very successful measures. And if anybody is interested, I could also dwell a little bit on that aspect. Thank you very much for your attention. to, to um, uh, domestic society. Uh, as we know, as we all know, I think, uh, Italy is characterized by very strong regional and local identities that intersect with, in very interesting ways with the sense of what it means to be Italian. And so I'm curious as to how this evolving emphasis on Europe is, is evolving within Italian society. To what degree do you think in Within Italy, people are developing a sense of identity with Europe and a commitment to the European project that is beyond, let's say, the, the, the political leadership of the country. Absolutely. I think it's a very good question. Uh, frankly speaking, I think this feeling of, of, of being European and being part of the European project and supporting that project has truly be, been a horizontal trend within Italian society for decades. Um, any of the polls done in European countries have consistently shown Italians to be the, the highest supporters of the whole process of European integration. Um, 70, 75, 80 percent of the population has consistently supported this, seen only benefits in this uh, process. 
I will now elaborate in a few seconds about the most recent trends because we, should, we must be careful of those. But let me continue on this point. I don't see a contradiction uh, between the originalism of Italy, which you're absolutely right, is, is very much present in society. For those of you who know Italy, even, even geographically, if you, if you have visited Italy, if you are living on a town on the top of a hill in Italy, which is normally the case, that's where towns are built in Italy, on the top of a hill, imagine Tuscany or Umbria or wherever else, your worst adversary is not the big town 500 kilometers away. Your worst adversary is the next small town on the next hill, one kilometer away. So this is really the way in which uh, Italians feel, there is a sense of regionally, we are at the end of the day very much individualists, and, and I, I'm happy with that, I have no problems with that, frankly speaking. Uh, so you're absolutely right, there is a very striking difference between you know, Sicily and Venice, uh, Tuscany and, and Piedmont. But this has in no way harmed this process of support for European integration. I lived in Belgium uh, many, many years of my life. Maybe there are even some Belgian students or people in, in this room. Are there any? They are not. But anyway, it's a great country, but it's a country which is very strongly divided in two communities, as you may have heard, the Wallons and the and Flemish, they speak different languages, etc. And I remember some interviews uh, done on TV, and, and the question was, of course you feel Belgian. And the answer was, well, not really. You feel Flemish, well, not really. What, what do you feel? I feel European. And, and I think that's, that's a very strong notion, which I think is completely consistent with the approach in Italy. So once again, you can have regionalism, but you can also live with a strong um, European idea. I promise you to comment on what is happening in the last 12 months. And I think it's a process that we should tackle very, very carefully. Because unfortunately, because of the European uh, of the Euro crisis, governments have been forced to take some pretty tough economic measures. And I'm talking here about cutting salaries, cutting pensions, uh, raising taxes. And unfortunately, some of this has been either perceived or portrayed as being quote-unquote, imposed by Europe. And this has inevitably changed the mood in part of the population. And this is something we should all be very, very careful to. Because if Europe becomes synonym of uh, uh, negative things upon, imposed upon me, well, then the whole image of the European integration process and project and vision changes. And we must be very careful to that we've had in the Italian elections, some protest groups elected with a very major uh, electoral result, uh, the, the Five Star Party, actually a movement, it's not a party, it's a movement. Uh, they got about 25%. And even in Britain, uh, the elections of uh, one week ago, regional elections, showed an anti-Europe uh, result of exactly the same number, 25%. In Britain. So, once again, we must monitor these trends very, very carefully and make sure that the benefits are perceived uh, more than the potential uh, downsides in terms of what is the European policy. So, so far, so good for Italy, but we must be very careful. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm very glad to hear that uh, you're optimistic about the European Union in the future. Uh, some people, however, uh, are less optimistic, as you probably know. And um, it seems to me that uh, a major problem and perhaps a major mistake that the European Union made initially was to put all the countries under one straitjacket. The strong ones and the weak ones under one exchange rate, a unified exchange rate. And now we see the results, really, of this. The, the periphery countries uh, like Portugal, Spain, even Italy and Greece are suffering because they cannot devalue their currency to stimulate uh, inflows of foreign investment that would create employment and all of that. So Italy now has had negative economic growth for how many years? Uh, I think five or six years in a row, and 
uh, Greece even worse and Spain worse. Spain, the young people in Spain have now unemployment of about 60% of all the young people cannot find a job. And I think that the, the mistake, the, the basic core of that mistake was to have them all under this exchange rate that suits Germany well, the German economy well, even the French one not so well. If they didn't have <laughs> the same exchange rate, they could be valued. And we would see a different economic result. Absolutely. Now, this is a very important point. And, and I see two aspects here, frankly speaking. And, and by the way, just to set the record straight, um, I think we've had uh, negative GDP growth for the past couple of years. For the rest, it has been very stagnant, so a growth of you know, 0.5%. So I would argue the Italian economy has been stagnant for the last uh, five or seven years. Uh, and last year, as, as you are correctly saying, it's less 1.5%. Also for this year, it will be less 1.5%. So as I was saying, I see two, two issues here. One is that once the euro was introduced, the notion behind it was that it would force uh, the countries, but actually the individual entrepreneurs within each country, precisely because the instrument of uh, devaluing the currency, the national currency was not there anymore, push the nations and push the entrepreneurs to go ahead in terms of increasing productivity, investments, reduce the production costs, to be able to really meet that equalizing blanket that the euro provided. This was supposed to happen uh, when the euro was introduced. Unfortunately, and this is the main reason of the euro crisis, this did not individual um, industrialists, entrepreneurs, did not modernize their economy. They did not uh, put in enough investments to increase productivity. Some of them reacted to globalization, which is actually the other thing that happens, that globalization hit like a train all of a sudden. And so this competition coming from you know, the Far East or Brazil, etc., hit Europe like, like a running train. So some of them try to face this situation just by delocalizing production. So Italian companies delocalize to Romania or to the Balkans or to, or to China, but that's not the way to increase productivity. That's just the way to reduce the costs and to provide for income. So that's the first thing that happened, is that not enough domestic investment was done to increase productivity. And so this gap that you mentioned actually happened. The second thing that happened, I think, is even more fundamental. We went for a monetary union without a political union. So the two processes lagged, and one process lagged behind the other. In my view, in my personal view, I think that the political union uh, should have been at least at the same pace, if not at a further pace. And this is not what happened, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I think the wake-up call has been read loud and clear. And so the policies put into place right now lead me to be, uh, frankly, quite optimistic. I don't think anybody considers to say today the possibility that the euro would actually collapse. This was considered as a possibility uh, maybe 12 months ago, but I don't think that today that is any case, any other case. And even my friend uh, George Soros, with whom I speak every now and then, uh, of course he does publish some articles in that direction, but at the end of the day, I think he has. The EU is here to stay. But if there are also some questions about Italy, I would be delighted to take questions about Italy or NATO or the UN. I have a question. Actually, I'm interested in your opinion on how immigration towards all the different countries in the European Union impacts the individual countries as well as the integration and economic growth situation. Yes, uh, this is a strong phenomenon in, in a country like Italy. Italy has traditionally been a country of immigration. Uh, we are very proud that there are in the United States 26 million Americans of Italian descent. 26 million. We are very proud of that. I'm sure there are a few in the room. We are very proud of your presence and what you do in this great country. So Italy has been a country of immigration. Half of Argentina 
is of Italian origin. 35 million Brazilians are of Italian descent. So you see what kind of a country we have been. And then all of a sudden, let's say within the, na the last 10, 12 years, the process has changed. So Italy has become all of a sudden a country of immigration. Um, and I, I, I should tell you that very often this flow of immigrants, and there are quite many, believe me, they come with all sorts of, of means, uh, you know, small boats uh, initially across the Adriatic Sea from, uh, from Albania, or now they come mostly from Northern Africa, from Libya. You know, the Mediterranean is a very pleasant uh, and quiet sea, and the weather is fine, and it's only, what is it, uh, 80 miles, so why not jump on a boat and try to get to the shores of Italy? And, and, and many of these, actually, they don't want to stay in, in Italy. They, they Italy, at the end of the day, is the frontier of Europe, is the gateway to Europe. So all of them get in, and there are these centers in which they are screened and held, and then they get out and they move elsewhere in Europe. Most of them, many of them move to Germany or, or to the Netherlands or to Scandinavia. And it is an issue, right, to tell you, um, it will require an adaptation uh, in, in society, which uh, um, it's not something that happens immediately. Uh, but situations are changing, schools are becoming uh, multi-ethnic. I think Italy, little by little, is coming to grips with the notion of multi-ethnicity, which is, I think, a very dynamic and very important uh, element. And, for instance, in the government uh, created by Mr. Litta just a few weeks ago, actually two weeks ago, uh, one of the ministers, the Minister for Integration, is an um, African-Italian, if I can use this expression. She comes from, uh, from Congo. Uh, she's a remarkable lady, and she is, so the, the secretary for immigration in the Italian government is um, African-Italian, so I think this shows that little by little things are moving. It's a fact of life that in spite of having uh, a significant unemployment rate, about 11%, there are some jobs that for some reason uh, Italians uh, don't really want to do. And that's really a shame because that works you know, in, in agriculture or in uh, farming or in industries. So this is where the integration, I think, will happen more and more. And, and so that's the trend that we have, uh, at least in, in Italy. So once again, massive inflow, new phenomenon, coming to grips with it, and many of them don't stay in Italy, they move uh, north. Um, Ambassador, uh, just wanted to ask a very quick question about the uh, possibility of the creation of something called an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. About six weeks ago, uh, Secretary Liu, um, Jack Liu, Secretary of the US Treasury, was in, um, in Europe talking to the European Union and the European Central Bank and a variety of other authorities of potentially creating this, authority, this, this particular structure that would allow the resolution of the logjam of the European banking system, which is the biggest problem towards the resolution of the economic crisis and financial crisis in Europe. Just as an, as an aside, that even the best bank in Europe, Deutsche Bank, has a capital to assets ratio of 2%, which is unsustainable in the long term. A uh, plethora of, of bad loans. Uh, French banks are, are, are in really bad shape. Italian banks are in terrible shape, except one. Uh, I don't work for them, so I can say that uh, ISP, Tesa San Paolo, actually has good um, equity, to, uh, equity to asset ratio. I would, I'm asking this question, if, whether you, uh, you are aware about what's going on with this negotiation is by now. I mean, this is urgent, and I thought that by now uh, the major hurdles towards the creation of this particular facility would have been uh, ironed out between the European Union, the US Treasury, and, uh, and the IMF. Uh, but there must be some obstacles here um, intervening, and because these banks can't loan anything to anybody because they're uh, in parlance, they're toast. So I was wondering whether you have an idea of what's going on here. Um, I must confess you, I'm not familiar with this particular vehicle that you have described. Um, what I can tell you is that the, the banks in, in Europe and certainly in, uh, in Italy, what they have done uh, in this phase in which they have in which they have benefited from inflows of capital facilitated by the role of the European Central Bank and governments, they have actually used that inflow of funds just to replenish their, 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 their funds and to put their house in order, their accounts in order. 
but they have not anymore done their primary task, which I believe should be to give loans to the uh, real economy and to provide for the jumpstart of the economy. And this is the single most serious problem we have, uh, certainly in Italy, that the money is just sitting in the banks and is not being used for profitable, of course, investments and profitable loans uh, to, to enterprises. And this is one of the factors that prevents the economy from, uh, from, uh, uh, from resuming its pace. And this is a shame because we are at a time when interest rates are so dramatically low, the European Central Bank is once again reduced by 25 basis points uh, last week. It's now virtually free, it's 0.5%, uh, as, 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 as you know, but still the banks uh, are not providing for enough uh, liquidity to the system and that is, I think, a uh, major shortcoming. But I will double check on this um, SPV that you mentioned, I think it's an important facility. Ambassador, could I, could I ask you to uh, speak to uh, the, uh, uh, the importance of the arts um, to Italians, to Italy, and uh, more especially um, in schools and in the light of young people in Italy. Um, does the government, can the government um, support and help? Um, how is education in the arts uh, being developed in Italy when the country is going through you know, such turmoil at the moment, uh, uh, fiscally anyway? Right. Well, um, I think it remains a priority and frankly I do not see any specific effect on that sector of the Italian education as a result uh, of the financial crisis. Uh, since we're talking about the financial crisis, I don't want to leave you with a with negative impression. I will come back to art because once you get started on art, we don't know where we're going to end. But let me spend a few words on the fiscal and economic uh, 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 measures taken in Italy because that's truly important. You do know that the government of Mr. Monti, the previous Prime Minister, was setting to uh, power in November of 2011 as a result of the Euro crisis and the government has taken some very impressive measures both on the fiscal side and on the side of uh, reforms. Uh, on the fiscal side, um, uh, because of the measures I mentioned to you earlier, you know, salary extensions, taxes and many, many others, the uh, deficit has been uh, decreased very significantly so it's, it has been between 20 12 and now in 2013, between 2.5 and 2.9 percent of GDP, which is a remarkable figure by, by any standards, I would, I, would, um, I would argue, including, for instance, if you look at the US deficit for, for the last few years. So, once again, between 2.5 and 2.9 percent of deficit. Of course, the problem of Italy is not the deficit, is the debt, the accumulated debt in many, 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 many years. Um, we uh, have seen interest rates go down significantly, including the spread between the Italian bonds and the German bonds. There is a lot of liquidity in the international markets. The measures taken have made those bonds credible, so the interest rates have gone down very dramatically. And Italy has a primary surplus of, uh, let's say, between 3 and 3.5, 4 percent, depending on the year, which is one of the highest primary surpluses uh, in the world. Uh, what is the primary surplus? The primary surplus is the deficit less the interests that you pay on the past death debt. Okay, so that's the primary surplus, and we have a primary surplus of about once again 3.3, 3.5%, which is very significant. So very important measures have been set in, in the fiscal discipline because that is truly the prerequisite uh, from which to be able to do anything else. If you don't put your house in order, on the fiscal side, you cannot do much else. The other thing that uh, the government of Monti has been trying to do has been to try to reform the economy to um, eliminate some uh, distortions, uh, inefficiencies that exist in the system, uh, cutting down on the bureaucracy, on the red tape, and things like that. Of course, it takes time, it will take time, but the measures have been introduced to facilitate the opening of new uh, industries. Uh, to reduce the number of authorizations and regulations that impact on the economy uh, and many, many other areas. For instance, uh, in the judicial system, which is seen as not being particularly efficient in Italy, well, the government of Mr. Monti has introduced some measures uh, to particularly streamline the civilian uh, procedures, um, which are the ones that impact the economy the most. So what happens in Italy, we have a huge bottleneck 
in the appeals. Everybody appeals the first ruling of the tribunal. Uh, let's say probably about 80% or 90% of the first rulings are appealed to the second level of courts. And about 80% of those are refused. I mean, they are, the initial decision is confirmed. So now the government has introduced a mechanism by, by which there will be a judge that will be able to eliminate those appeals that are evidently frivolous, as they, as they say, they are unfounded. There is no reason to appeal uh, an initial ruling. So this will eliminate the most of the backlog and accelerate the uh, decisions and the rulings in the judicial system. There will also be branches specialized in economic disputes with specialized judges and accelerated uh, timetables to take the decisions in there. So all of this is meant to make the judicial system in the civilian part more credible and reliable and faster, frankly speaking, which hopefully should facilitate investments. There have also been some measures to uh, make the labor market more flexible. We have a pretty rigid labor market in Italy, which does not, does not facilitate the young generations in accessing the labor market. So we have uh, introduced measures to make it to a certain extent more flexible as frankly it should be. And I can go on and on. So I just wanted to leave you with the image and the impression of the massive amount of measures that have been taken by the recent government, not only uh, on the side of fiscal discipline, which is, as I said, fundamental, but also in terms of uh, uh, stimulating the economy and, and job creation. Of course, as I said, it takes time for those measures to bite and to come into, into, into into fruition. Now, the arts, I don't see them as particularly suffering from uh, this particular uh, process. Uh, there have been sort of horizontal cuts a little bit everywhere, so they may have suffered like everybody else has suffered in, in some activity, but not specifically the arts. Um, let me, however, say one thing to you about this particular year. 2013 is the year of Italian culture in the United States. So we have launched a, a huge number of events, about 200 events in 50 American cities, uh, in eight, with 80 American museums and opera houses and universities uh, to uh, promote uh, Italian culture in this, in this country. Uh, and we will try to showcase, obviously, the traditional Italian heritage, artistic heritage, cultural heritage, you know, exhibitions with Michelangelo, with uh, Caravaggio, with Giotto, uh, opera of Verdi and Bellini, and I could go on and on with that. And that's going to be a very strong part of this. But in addition to this, we also want to showcase Italy's creativity and, and innovation. So there will be a big part of this, which will be about design and technology and, and research. And um, I think it's a combination which provides, I think, for a fair image of what uh, the Italy of today in the area of art and culture actually is. So if you run into initiatives that are under the logo of 2013, the year of Italian culture in the United States, do go and visit. Uh, we put in a huge effort and, and frankly we've done it in a way which is not impacting the economy. Actually, we thought we impact in a positive way. Uh, let me tell you why. Because of the financial crisis, we felt it was not right to knock on the door of the government and to ask for special funding from this, as it happened in the past, you know, the year of Italian culture in China, in Japan, in Russia, they were supported by important government financing. We didn't think it was the right thing to do in the current situation, so we didn't ask for any special funding. We, on the one hand, scraped the bottom of the barrel, there was not much there, but that's what we used. And then we did a lot of uh, uh, interaction with the industry. So we have sponsors and, and large sponsors, small sponsors, and that's how we're doing it. This will seem completely natural to you because that's the way art exhibitions, uh, opera are done in the US. Believe me, that's not the way it is normally done uh, in Europe or certainly not in Italy. So we hope that this model of the private public funding that we put together for this particular event, which is a major event, will be a good model, a best case scenario to show to others who want to do art-related initiatives without having to knock, of, to knock on the door of the federal funding, which I don't think should happen anymore.
c'est systématique euh, pour les autres. Yes, sir. Uh, question. I, I think I already said that unfortunately we are not there yet in terms of uh, political union. I wish we were more ahead in terms of political union. We are not there yet, so yes, you're right. Uh, I think I said that uh, Italy is punching below its weight in terms of foreign policy, and I think uh, you're right on this. But I also believe that, it, that uh, Europe remains a, a, a very uh, strong actor nevertheless. And uh, when I look at the United States, for instance, let me give you two elements, politically and economically. Politically, it is only natural for the US to turn to Europe when it has a major international policy issue to handle. And for instance, if you look at the Middle East, uh, Kerry has been in Europe, has been back in Europe, he was in Europe on Monday, again discussing uh, uh, Middle East issues, Syria issues. That remains the primary interlocutor for the US on the major international policy issues. With all due respect, um, the US, Washington is not looking to Brazil, it's not looking to China, it's not looking to India, with all due respect, to solve the uh, crisis in the Middle East. And frankly speaking, it could, it could also be a geographical, a geopolitical reason. Obviously, for us Europeans, <laughs> the Middle East is right there. And obviously, for other countries, uh, globally, it's much more distant. So, strong political interaction. Economically, I would like to give you this figure, and please note this figure. We imagine these huge flows of investment and trade between the uh, US and, uh, and China. Well, that is not the case. The US investments to Europe are 20 times larger than the US investment to China. Once again, the US investments to Europe are 20 times larger than the US investments to China. And I'm not talking about stock. I'm not talking about the stock of past investments, which obviously many, many years have accumulated from the US in, in Europe. I'm talking about flow. I'm talking about the flow of investments, for instance, in 2012. So this shows that uh, even today, even with the emergence of countries like China, India, Brazil, these are great countries, we, do, we welcome their, their development. Even in this situation, Europe remains the number one partner for investment for the United States. So, I think we still have a pretty strong role today. Euro is there to stay, but also Europe is there to stay. Thank you so much. I'm looking at my Consul General. I yeah. think uh, I have to <laughs> rush to the egg for the airport, but thank you very much for your presence and for your attention. And, uh,